You might know these teens for a bunch of things, but today we're flipping the script and digging into a whole different side of their stories. Today we're exploring a side of teenagers, one that takes a bit of a dark turn. Imagine regular teens, just like any of us, but with a mysterious twist. Get ready to witness their reactions as they navigate the tough reality of life sentences. Stick around because we are going to show you teen killers reacting to life sentences you don't want to miss out on. Christine Paulilla. Christine Marie Paulilla, born in 1986, faced early challenges, losing her father at two, leading to her mother's struggle with drug addiction. Diagnosed with alopecia, she endured bullying, impacting her self-esteem. A move to Texas brought a fresh start, with Christine befriending Rachel Colarutis and Tiffany Rowell in high school, transforming her image. However, her life took a darker turn when she entered a relationship with Christopher Lee Snyder, marked by drug abuse and criminal activities. Concerns from family and friends about Snyder's troubled past went unheeded. The relationship turned toxic toxic, with Snyder isolating Christine and allegations of abuse. On July 18, 2003, Christine Paulilla and Christopher Snyder carried out a violent plan to steal drugs from a friend's home in Clear Lake City, Texas. The robbery escalated into a deadly confrontation, resulting in the murders of Tiffany Rowell, Rachel Colarutis, Marcus Priscilla, and Adalbert Sanchez. Motivated by twisted sexual jealousy, Paulilla and Snyder shot their victims multiple times. Both Colarutis and Rowell had been shot in the crotch, a disturbing indication of the depths of Paulilla's rage and possessiveness. The aftermath saw them trying to resume normal lives, concealing their dark secret. In 2004, Snyder's arrest led to the end of their relationship. Paulilla, haunted by guilt, confessed to her new partner, Stanley Justin Rott, in 2005. Married to Rott and battling drug addiction, Paulilla's guilt intensified in July 2005, prompting her to reveal their involvement in the Clear Lake murders. The couple went into hiding, but was eventually discovered in July 2006 after an anonymous tip. On July 19, 2006, the authorities tracked down Paulilla in San Antonio and arrested her. During the investigation, Rott revealed the shocking details of Paulilla's involvement in the murders. He disclosed that she had confessed to him that she actively participated in the killings, even going back into the house to beat Colorutis to death with a gun after finding her still clinging to life. Paulilla initially denied her role in the murders, placing the blame solely on Snyder. However, as the evidence mounted against her, she eventually admitted to participating in the crimes. On July 21, 2006, Paulilla and Snyder, who had not yet been apprehended, were charged with capital murder. Due to the severity of the charges and the risk of flight, Paulilla's bail was set at $500,000. Tragically, Snyder's story took a devastating turn. In June 2006, he moved to Greenville, South Carolina, where he was living with a woman he had met online. Upon learning of Paulilla's arrest and the warrant for his own arrest, Snyder's family contacted him, informing him of the situation. Fearing capture and unable to face the consequences of his actions, Snyder took his own life by overdosing on prescription medication. In October 2008, Paulilla stood before the court. As a juvenile offender at the time of the killings, she was spared the death penalty. The prosecution presented a compelling case, supported by witness testimonies, forensic evidence, and the chilling confession Paulilla had made to her husband, Stan. Justin Rott. Paolilla's defense team, on the other hand, sought to shift the blame onto Christopher Snyder, portraying him as the mastermind behind the murders. They argued that Paolilla had been under his influence and control coerced into participating in the violent acts. After weeks of intense courtroom proceedings, the jury reached a verdict. On October 13, 2008, Christine Paolilla was found guilty on all four counts of capital murder. The following day, she was sentenced to life in prison, with a minimum of 40 years before she would be eligible for parole. In the after of the trial, Paulilla filed an appeal on November 29, 2008, challenging the court's decision on her bail amount. She claimed that the trial court had abused its discretion in setting her bail at $500,000. However, an appeals panel reviewed the case and determined that the court had not acted improperly. Paulilla's original sentence was affirmed, leaving her with no recourse but to serve her life sentence. As of 2023, Paulilla remains incarcerated at the Christina Melton Crane Unit in Gatesville, Texas. She is expected to be eligible for parole in July. July 2046, when she will be 60 years old. Lionel Tate. In the annals of crime, few cases have gripped the nation quite like that of this notorious teen killer. Born on January 30, 1987, in Broward County, Florida, Tate's life took a sinister turn at the tender age of 13 when he was convicted of first-degree murder. The victim? A six-year-old girl named Tiffany Eunuch. On the fateful day of July 28, 1999, Tate was left alone with six-year-old Tiffany Eunuch, who was being babysat by his mother, Kathleen Grosset Tate. Little did anyone know that this innocent playdate would end in 
unimaginable horror. While the children were downstairs playing, Tate's mother called to them, urging them to be quiet. But what happened next would forever change the lives of those involved. Approximately 45 minutes later, Tate emerged from the depths of the house, his face filled with terror. He rushed to his mother, his voice trembling, and delivered the devastating news. Tiffany was not breathing. What awaited Tate's mother as she rushed to Tiffany's side was a scene of unimaginable brutality. Tiffany's small body bore the marks of a violent assault. Her legs, feet, and neck were covered in serious bruises, evidence of the sheer force that had been inflicted upon her. The prosecution would later reveal that the extent of her injuries was akin to those sustained from a collision with a speeding car, but the horror did not end there. Tiffany's other injuries included a fractured skull lacerated liver, a fractured rib, and a swollen brain. The prosecution painted a chilling picture, describing these injuries as similar to those she would have sustained by falling from a three-story building. It was these harrowing details that led to the conviction of Lionel Tate for first-degree murder. The presiding judge declared that the acts committed by Tate were not the playful acts of a child, but rather they were cold, callous, and indescribably cruel. The prosecution argued that Tate's actions were not accidental, but rather a deliberate and intentional act of abuse. Florida staff statutes required the jury to convict Tate of first-degree murder, even if they did not believe he had intended to kill or injure Tiffany. However, soon the story of Lionel Tate took an unexpected turn. In January 2004, a state appeals court overturned his conviction, citing the lack of a mental competency evaluation before his trial. This ruling opened the door for Tate to accept a plea deal that he had previously turned down. He was released from prison and placed under house arrest for one year, followed by 10 years of probation. While this outcome provided Tate with a chance at redemption, it also reignited discussions about the fairness and effectiveness of the justice system in dealing with juvenile offenders. In May 2005, Lionel Tate faced new charges of armed burglary, armed robbery, and violation of probation. The Broward County Sheriff's Office detailed disturbing events, revealing Tate's descent into further criminal activity. In March 2006, he accepted a plea bargain, admitting to probation violation by possessing a gun during a violent robbery. However, he refused to disclose details about the weapon's origin. At the sentencing hearing in April 2006, Tate received a 30-year prison term for violating probation, a substantial increase in punishment. On October 24, 2007, Florida's 4th District Court of Appeal upheld the sentence, emphasizing the gravity of Tate's crimes and the imperative for justice. In a final twist, on February 19, 2008, Tate pled no contest to the robbery charges. He was sentenced to an additional 10 years in state prison to be served concurrently with his 30-year sentence for violating probation. Today, Lionel Tate remains imprisoned at the Charlotte Correctional Institution, serving his sentence for armed robbery and probation violation. Eric Smith. In 1993, the tranquil town of Savona was forever changed when 13-year-old Eric Smith committed a heinous crime. On a summer morning, he lured four-year-old Derek Roby into the woods, promising a shortcut to a local park. Once alone, Eric strangled and brutally beat Derek, leaving the innocent child lifeless. Derek's body was discovered hours later, sending shockwaves of fear through the community. In the aftermath of the murder, the community was consumed by fear. The assumption was that the killer must be a stranger, an outsider who had influenced infiltrated their peaceful town. But as the investigation unfolded, suspicions began to arise about Eric Smith's involvement in the crime. A family friend, Marlene Haskell, recalled a chilling conversation she had with Eric on the night of the murder. Eric asked her what would happen if it turned out to be a kid. I told him that whoever did this needed serious psychiatric help. He seemed intrigued by her response, almost as if he had seen or known something. Marlene's concerns grew as she connected the dots. Eric had been to the same park near the crime scene, and his behavior on that fateful day raised red flags. She immediately alerted Eric's mother, and together, they took him to the police command post to meet with investigators. Investigator John Hipsch vividly remembers the encounter with Eric, who seemed to derive pleasure from speaking about the murder. He didn't want it to end. It was as if he reveled in the attention and the power he felt from taking someone's life. Initially, Eric denied seeing Derek, but under the weight of mounting evidence and the pressure of the investigation, he eventually confessed to the heinous crime. In August 1994, Eric Smith, now four 14 years old, stood trial as an adult and was sentenced to nine years to life in prison for second-degree murder. The community hoped that this would bring closure and ensure that Eric would never have the opportunity to harm another innocent life. Little did they know that the nightmare was far from over. Eric would have multiple parole hearings over the years, reopening the wounds of the Roby family and the community. The fear of his potential release loomed large as they fought tirelessly to keep him behind bars. As the years went by, Eric spoke out about his experience and claimed to have changed. In 
2004, during a parole board hearing, he admitted to deriving pleasure from the act of strangling Derek, as it made him feel powerful instead of being the victim. He even confessed that if he hadn't been caught, he likely would have been killed again. These chilling revelations confirmed the belief of prosecutor John Tunney that Eric, at the age of 13, was a budding serial killer. The parole board denied his release in 2004, recognizing the danger he posed to society. Despite his claims of remorse and rehabilitation, Eric's parole was denied time and time again. In 2009, Eric was interviewed by a news affiliate where he expressed his hope of becoming a counselor to help other bullied kids. He claimed that his anger was not directed at Derek, but at those who had tormented him. He professed to have changed through years of therapy, but the community remained skeptical. The parole hearings continued, each one reopening the wounds of the Roby family and the community. Finally, in October 2021, after 27 years of incarceration, Eric Smith was granted parole. The news sent shockwaves through the community, and the Roby family held a peaceful protest to express their opposition to his release. They feared that Eric's release would only bring more pain and suffering. The release was delayed for months as Eric sought approved housing. Finally, in February 2022, at the age of 42, he walked out of prison as a free man. He now resides in Queens, New York, far away from the community that still mourns the loss of Derek Roby. Alyssa Bustamante Next is the disturbing case of Alyssa Bustamante, a teenage girl from Missouri who committed a heinous crime that left her small community in disbelief. Alyssa, at the age of 15, brutally murdered her nine-year-old neighbor, Elizabeth Olton, in October 2009. The details of the crime are truly shocking. As Elizabeth was walking home, Bustamante lured her into the woods, taking advantage of their friendship. In a shocking act of violence, Alyssa strangled, beat, and stabbed Elizabeth, slashing her throat and leaving her in a shallow grave covered with leaves. The autopsy revealed the extent of the brutality inflicted on the innocent girl. Bustamante's disturbing diary entries and online activities further exposed her troubled state of mind. She expressed a morbid curiosity about killing and described the act as enjoyable once she overcame initial apprehensions. Her YouTube account contained alarming content, including videos of self-harm and encouraging her brothers to touch an electrified fence. Alyssa's troubled background, marked by a history of depression, suicide attempts, and family issues, was presented as part of her defense during the legal proceedings. What makes this case even more unsettling is the fact that Alyssa later confessed to the crime and led the police to the body, leaving no doubt about her guilt. As the trial of Alyssa Bustamante unfolded, the courtroom was filled with tension and anticipation. Bustamante, a 15-year-old girl at the time of the murder, had pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and armed criminal action. During the sentencing hearing, the prosecution presented a page from Bustamante's diary, which revealed disturbing details about the murder. In her own words, she described the act in chilling detail leaving those in the courtroom horrified. The defense, on the other hand, argued for leniency, presenting evidence of Bustamante's troubled childhood and her history of psychological problems. They painted a picture of a young girl who had been failed by her circumstances and desperately needed help and rehabilitation. Bustamante's attorney, Charlie Morland, emphasized that she was a child who had been spiraling out of control but had treatable conditions. However, the prosecution vehemently disagreed, describing Bustamante as a truly evil individual who had strangled and stabbed an innocent child simply for the thrill of it. They argued that the severity of the crime warranted the maximum punishment. Judge Joyce sentenced Bustamante to life in prison with the possibility of parole for second-degree murder. Additionally, she ordered a consecutive 30-year term for armed criminal action, reflecting the brutality of the crime. Under Missouri guidelines, Bustamante would have to serve 35 years and five months in prison before she would be eligible for parole. The Department of Corrections would evaluate whether the more than two years she spent in jail while awaiting sentence could be counted toward that time. After spending several weeks at a diagnostic prison, Bustamante would be placed in one of Missouri's two female prisons or potentially sent out of state. The department officials would also consider whether she should be kept separate from other adult female inmates. Alyssa Bustamante showed an emotional reaction as she received her sentence. Shackled and with her hands restrained to her waist, Bustamante addressed the court and, more importantly, the family of her victim. In a moment of remorse, Alyssa rose from her chair and turned to face Elizabeth's family. She struggled to find the right words, acknowledging the inadequacy of language to express the depth of her remorse. With a deep breath, Alyssa stated, I really am extremely very sorry for everything. If I could give my life to get her back, I would. I'm sorry. Erin Caffey
In the small town of Alba, Texas, a seemingly ordinary teenager named Erin Caffey would become entangled in a web of darkness and manipulation. Erin Caffey was born on July 26, 1991, to Terry and Penny Caffey, a deeply religious couple who were well-respected in their community. Erin grew up alongside her two brothers, 8-year-old Tyler and 13-year-old Matthew, in a loving and close-knit family. At the age of 16, she met 18-year-old Charlie Wilkinson while working part-time as a waitress at a Sonic fast food restaurant. Their relationship quickly blossomed, but behind the facade of young love, there were warning signs that would go unnoticed until it was too late. Terry Caffey, Erin's father, had reservations about Charlie from the beginning. He couldn't shake the feeling that there was something off about him. Little did Terry know that his instincts were right on the mark. As Erin's relationship with Charlie grew more serious, her behavior began to change. She became distant from her family and started to slip up in school. Concerned about their daughter's well-being, Terry and Penny decided to investigate Charlie further. What they discovered on his MySpace page sent chills down their spines. Sexual references, talk of alcohol, and a general disregard for authority painted a troubling picture of the young man who had captured their daughter's heart. Alarmed by what they had found, Terry and Penny confronted Erin, demanding that she end her relationship with Charlie. However, Erin's infatuation with Charlie had grown into something much deeper. Fueled by a dangerous obsession, Erin began to express her desire to kill her parents to her friends. In her twisted mind, it was the only way she could be free to be with Charlie. In the early hours of March 1st, 2008, Erin Caffey's twisted plan unfolded when Charlie and Charles Wade entered the cafe home armed. Unaware, Erin waited in the car with Wade's girlfriend. Inside, Charlie insisted on killing Erin's brothers, Tyler and Matthew, as witnesses. Shockingly, Erin callously agreed. Terry and Penny, Erin's parents, were shot by Charlie. When the gun jammed, Wade used a sword, almost decapitating Penny. Upstairs, Tyler and Matthew suffered brutal attacks. The family murdered, Charlie and Wade looted, setting the house ablaze to cover their tracks. Terry, surviving, crawled out, leaving behind the horrifying nightmare. In the aftermath of the brutal Cafe family massacre, Law enforcement agencies swiftly launched an intensive investigation to bring the perpetrators to justice. Terry Caffey, the sole survivor of the massacre, provided crucial information to the authorities. As the investigation unfolded, the true extent of Erin Caffey's involvement in the planning and execution of the murders became apparent. Wilkinson and his accomplice, Charles Wade, both confessed that Erin was the mastermind behind the entire massacre. Erin initially attempted to maintain her innocence, claiming that she had been kidnapped and held against her will during the night of the murders. However, her story quickly crumbled under the weight of overwhelming evidence and the testimonies of her co-conspirators. Less than 24 hours after the Cafe family murders, all four suspects were in police custody. Erin Caffey, Charlie Wilkinson, Charles Wade, and Wade's girlfriend Bobby Johnson were charged with three counts of capital murder. Wilkinson and Wade, facing overwhelming evidence against them, pleaded guilty to their charges. Their confessions and cooperation with the authorities were taken into account during sentencing. Both were handed life sentences without the possibility of parole. Erin Caffey's trial, however, presented a more complex situation. Despite her active participation in the planning and execution of the murders, Erin's age at the time of the crime and her claims of manipulation by Wilkinson played a role in the proceedings. Prosecutors sought the death penalty for Erin, arguing that her actions warranted the harshest punishment. However, Terry Caffey, in an extraordinary act of forgiveness, intervened and requested that the death penalty not be pursued. Guided by his faith and a belief in redemption, Terry chose a path of forgiveness and hoped for his daughter's eventual rehabilitation. The jury ultimately sentenced Erin Caffey to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 40 years. This decision took into account her age at the time of the crime and the potential for rehabilitation. Terry chose to maintain a relationship with Erin, visiting her in prison and searching for answers to the questions that plagued him. Erin, still denying her role in the planning of the murders, insisted to her father that she had tried to run away from Wilkinson the night of the crime but was forced to wait in the car. Craig Prince. Next, we have Craig Chandler Price, the youngest serial killer in U.S. history. Between the ages of 13 and 15, Price committed a series of gruesome murders that would forever haunt the residents of Warwick. On a summer night in 1987, 13-year-old Craig Chandler Price committed his first murder. Living just two houses away from his victim, he carefully planned and executed a brutal attack on 27-year-old Rebecca Spencer. Armed with a knife, Price delivered 58 stab wounds to Spencer's defenseless body, leaving a haunting scene for authorities to 
discover. Two years later, now 15 and fueled by a toxic mix of marijuana and LSD, Price unleashed a killing spree on his neighbors, the Heaton family. On September 1st, 1989, he brutally attacked Joan Heaton while she prepared dinner, stabbing her frenziedly. Jennifer, 10, and Melissa, 7. Joan's daughters witnessed the horror as Price mercilessly took their mother's life. Frozen in fear, Jennifer saw her sister fall victim to Price's wrath, crushed by an unimaginable force. In the aftermath of the murders, Price's true nature was laid bare. Calmly and without remorse, he confessed to the heinous crimes he had committed. Regarding motive, Price asserted that enduring racism from white individuals since childhood, particularly an incident where he alleged a group of white adults targeted him with racial slurs and attempted to run him over, fueled his desire for someone's death. Despite the chilling revelations, Craig benefited from Rhode Island's legal system. Confessing just before turning 16, he could only be held in a training school until his 21st birthday, receiving no prison time for the heinous murders. Legislative efforts, including the Craig Price Bill, sought to address legal loopholes, allowing his impending freedom. Eventually, new charges, such as assault and extortion, delayed his release. A 1994 trial found him guilty, resulting in a 15-year sentence. Denied parole in March 2009, he was set to be released in May 2020. Transferred to Florida in 2004 due to violent tendencies, Price engaged in a prison fight on July 29, 2009, involving a handmade shiv that injured a correctional officer. After this, he was moved to another facility. On April 4, 2017, Price faced accusations of stabbing inmate Joshua Davis in Florida using a 5-inch homemade knife. On January 18, 2019, he was sentenced to 25 years for this crime. Nehemiah Grigo. Nehemiah Grigo was born and raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico, a city known for its vibrant culture and tight-knit communities. Growing up, Grigo appeared to be an ordinary teenager with no glaring signs of the darkness that lay within him. He came from a seemingly loving and supportive family, residing in a modest home in the South Valley neighborhood. However, beneath the surface, Grigo's life was far from idyllic. Sources close to the family revealed a troubled household plagued by domestic issues and strained relationships. Grigo's parents, Greg and Sarah Grigo, were known to have a tumultuous marriage marked by frequent arguments and instances of violence. Grigo's siblings, Zephaniah, Jail, and Angelina, also bore witness to this volatile environment. It is within this backdrop of familial turmoil that Grigo's motive begins to take shape. Investigators and psychologists who examined the case theorized that Grigo's actions were driven by a combination of factors, including a desire for control, a need for escape, and a distorted perception of reality. One prevailing theory suggests that Grigo's motive stemmed from a deep-rooted resentment towards parents and the chaos that permeated his home. Griego may have felt trapped in an environment where violence and instability were the norm. In his twisted mind, the act of taking control and eliminating his parents and siblings may have been seen as a way to escape the turmoil and establish a sense of power and dominance. The events leading up to the fateful day of the murders remain shrouded in mystery. Griego meticulously planned the killings, waiting until his family was asleep before executing his plan. Armed with multiple firearms, Griego methodically shot each family member one by one as they lay defenseless in their beds. The aftermath of the crime scene was nothing short of a nightmare. Grigo's parents' and siblings' innocent lives were cut short in a moment of unimaginable violence. As the investigation unfolded, Grigo's motive became a focal point for law enforcement and the legal system. The prosecution argued that Grigo's actions were driven by a combination of anger, resentment, and a desire for control. They painted a picture of a troubled young man who sought to exert power over his chaotic environment through the ultimate act of violence. However, Grigo Grigo's defense team presented a different narrative. They highlighted Grigo's troubled upbringing, the volatile nature of his home life, and his struggles with mental health. They argued that Grigo's actions were a desperate cry for help, a manifestation of his deep-seated pain and confusion. The sentencing hearing in Nehemiah Grigo's case was a highly anticipated event as the community and the nation awaited the judge's decision on the appropriate punishment for his heinous crimes. In her sentencing memo, Judge Hart acknowledged the gravity of Grigo's actions and the need for both punishment and protection of society. For the murders of his parents, Greg and Sarah Grigo, Judge Hart handed down a sentence of seven years. Grigo's defense team had argued for a more lenient sentence, citing his troubled upbringing and the need for rehabilitation. The judge then turned her attention to the murders of Grigo's three younger siblings, Zephaniah, Jail, and Angelina. For these heinous acts, Judge Hart imposed three life sentences with the possibility of parole. In her memo, Judge Hart explained the rationale behind her decision. She acknowledged that if she were to solely 
consider Grigo's crimes and nothing else, a sentence of life without parole would have been appropriate. However, she also took into account Grigo's home life with his parents and the progress he had made in treatment. The judge's decision to impose a life sentence with the possibility of parole was met with mixed reactions from the public. Some believed that Grigo should never be given the chance for release, while others saw the potential for rehabilitation and a second chance at life. Sean Sellers Next, we have the teen killer Sean Sellers, who was the youngest American sentenced to death since 1973. It all began on the fateful night of September 8, 1985, when Sellers and his friend Richard Howard walked into a Circle K convenience store in Oklahoma City. Armed with a .357 revolver, Sellers approached the counter where 35-year-old Robert Bauer was working. Without warning, Sellers pulled the trigger, firing slugs into Bauer's body. The senseless act of violence left Bauer dead and the store in a state of shock. What made this crime even more chilling was Sellers' admission to the police. He confessed that he had laughed about the murder, considering it a fantastic prank since Bauer had no idea why they had come to the store that night. It was a callous and cold-hearted act that left the community reeling, but this was just the beginning of Sellers' descent into darkness. Months later, on March 5, 1986, he committed an even more heinous act, sneaking into his mother and stepfather's bedroom while they slept. Sellers, wearing only his underwear to limit blood spatter, took aim at his stepfather and fired a fatal shot. The sound of the gunshot startled his mother, who awoke to find herself face to face with her own son in a horrifying moment. Sellers shot her in the face, ending her life. The brutality and calculated nature of these crimes were enough to send shockwaves through the community. But what was even more disturbing was Sellers' attempt to cover up his guilt. He meticulously arranged the crime scene to make it appear as if an intruder had committed the killings. It was a desperate and futile attempt to escape justice. As the investigation unfolded, another shocking revelation came to light. Sellers confessed to the 1985 killing of Robert. Paul Bauer, a Circle K convenience store clerk who had refused to sell him beer. At his trial, Sellers claimed to be a practicing Satanist at the time of the murders. He argued that he was under the influence of demonic possession, specifically by the demon Ezurat, which compelled him to commit these heinous acts. Sellers claimed to have read the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey hundreds of times between the ages of 15 and 16, believing it to be a legitimate way of life that would grant him control over his own destiny. His defense team also attempted to link his crimes to his alleged addiction to the game Dungeons and Dragons. They argued that the game had warped his mind and influenced his actions. However, Sellers himself later denied any connection between the game and his violent behavior, stating that using his past as an example of the game's effects was irrational and fanatical. Despite these claims, the jury remained unconvinced. Sellers was found guilty of multiple homicides and sentenced to death in 1986. At the time, Oklahoma law did not offer the option of a life sentence without the possibility of parole, so the jury opted for the ultimate punishment. Following his conviction for multiple homicides, Sellers pursued a series of appeals to evade the death penalty. His defense claimed he suffered from multiple personality disorder, arguing it played a role in his crimes. During a 1999 appeal, Sellers asserted insanity due to the disorder, but the 10th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals deemed it raised too late. Despite widespread appeals for clemency, including from the European Union and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Sellers' execution date neared. Two days prior, he filed appeals alleging bias in the State Pardon and Parole Board, but they were rejected. Another argued an error by the State Appellate Court regarding his insanity claim but it too was unsuccessful. Amidst the controversy, Sellers was executed on February 4, 1999, at 29, by lethal injection in Oklahoma. He addressed his step-sibling, urging them to find healing, and sang Christian music in his final moments. This was all about teen killers reacting to life sentences. Thank you for staying with us. If you enjoy our content, our newest videos are just a click away.